this was a very significant diplomatic milestone because essentially what he managed to do was negotiate the first face-to-face public meeting uh, between President Zelensky of Ukraine and the new incoming Donald Trump since he won that US election just last month. Macron invited Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and US President-elect Donald Trump to a meeting at the Elysee Presidential Palace. President, I just uh, say it's a great honor for, for French people to welcome you five years later. And uh, you were at that time present for the first time. And I remember the solidarity and your immediate reaction. So, welcome back again. Well, thank you very we are much. very happy to have you here. Thank you very much. Very great honor. Uh, joining us uh, now is former CNN anchor Nina Dos Santos. Nina, good afternoon. Afternoon, Alexis. Uh, Nina, how much political capital can Emmanuel Macron hope to get by his very kind uh, and welcoming words towards President-elect Donald Trump? Well, he's certainly queued up to be one of the first to, you know, lay out the red carpet for uh, Donald Trump. This was a very significant diplomatic milestone because essentially what he managed to do was negotiate the first face-to-face public meeting uh, between President Zelensky of Ukraine and the new incoming Donald Trump since he won that US election just last month. So it was significant. And we know that Macron throughout his two terms in office has been extremely adept at leveraging the glamour of Paris and these big uh, state events to try and flatter the egos of world leaders to get them together. A lot of it has to do with image. And then I suppose the hope there is that you can try and get some kind of diplomatic concessions going from uh, that, you know, uh, spectre, spectacle of these leaders standing next to each other and having this important trilateral meeting. Now, it almost looked as though it was going to go off on a bad footing because Donald Trump turned up more than, get this, 40 minutes late at first. And uh, he had a bit of a terse handshake. There were the, several handshakes, but it wasn't quite your sort of muscular um, bromance that we saw back in the early days of Emmanuel Macron's first term and Donald Trump's first term. Lots has happened since then, not least because Emmanuel Macron is much weakened on the domestic front. And of course, the war in Ukraine uh, continues. But it is significant nonetheless that it is a starting point for these two leaders to start to sort of have some kind of trilateral meeting upon which they can build. We don't know what the contents of that meeting was. We do know that members of the Zelensky, um, you know, a Praetorian guard, one of his closest advisors, Andrei Yermak, has already been sort of preparing the ground for this, having various meetings with the Trump administration uh, on the sidelines of various different events in the two weeks preamble to this big world event. I mean, it's often said that quite a lot of the the, the, the negotiations is happening away from the top men, the, 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 the cameras, it's happening with their back channel staff. Um, Nina, do we know a little bit more about who the French president is about to announce as his prime minister? No, and what's really interesting about this weekend was it was actually probably a bit of relief here for Emmanuel Macron to try and rebuild his international legacy, to salvage it somewhat on the international stage. But obviously, come this time tomorrow, it'll be back to work and he'll face some really staunch domestic criticism for the political impasse that he's very much blamed for having created with the decision to call those ill-fated elections in the summer that he didn't need to. That obviously fractured the French political system in various different directions. Um, He tried to find somebody in the form of Michel Barnier to, you know, uh, get a budget through for France, but that uh, hasn't managed to come to pass. It's the first time, obviously, that uh, France has turfed out a sitting prime minister since 1962 in a vote of no confidence. And what that means is that domestically, that probably leaves Emmanuel Macron's uh, domestic legacy in tatters. And political commentators in Paris are now uh, starting to say that it's very unlikely that he's going to be able to salvage his 
um, domestic reputation. Having said that, there are some names in the frame that uh, the political commentariat in Paris is starting to coalesce around. One of them is François Bayrou, who's a 73-year-old, a staunch centrist, but he isn't a member of the elite like Emmanuel Macron, so he could appeal to you know your average person from the left and the right. He's the son of a farmer from southwestern France, and he's also quite elderly at 73 years old, mm. uh, like Michel Barnier. He's only four years younger than Michel Barnier, in fact. And what isn't lost upon French people is that it's all the old political dinosaurs who are coming to the fore, largely because what have they got to lose? Um, the youngsters are loath to put their hats into the ring at this point because uh, politically the uh, situation between now and summer, which is the only next opportunity for calling fresh parliamentary elections, is fraught with difficulty. They don't necessarily want to be associated with an unpopular president at this point for the next six months um, because then they won't be able to salvage their reputation yeah. and run for office in the summer. And just uh, very briefly, Nina, this... Uh decision by Emmanuel Macron to invite President-elect Donald Trump in such a huge moment for the country, this reopening of uh, Notre Dame. How's it gone down with the French people? Do you, do they, is, it, is it been a popular choice or not? Well, I think it's important, obviously, to have the US president in France because uh, France is very worried about um, you know, double-digit tariffs, uh, wrecking its economic model at a time when, um, you know, Germany's obviously worried about that too. But the difference between France and Germany, apart from the fact that they both have political crises and votes of no confidence and governments that are falling at the moment, is that Germany doesn't have a huge amount of debt like France. France has a huge six mm percent -hmm. uh, and counting uh, deficit. GD, debt to GDP stands at 120% and its uh, bonds are now, the yields on its bonds are higher than Greece. And so there's real concerns about an economic crisis in France. And one of the things that could exacerbate that is if Donald Trump does uh, come through with his promise of putting 10 perhaps even more percent tariffs on European goods. You know, he's actually goaded Emmanuel Macron uh, in the last few months in the US electoral campaign by saying he's going to slap all sorts of tariffs on those luxurious France goods, like, for instance, champagne. So part of the spectacle of Macron getting Donald Trump to Paris in the first place is not just to flatter his ego to try and talk him back from the brink economically with regards to this American protectionism. It's it, it's also uh, putting Emmanuel Macron on the international stage, making him look like a power broker yeah. um, as well. Having said that, should point out his legacy is still considered quite patchy in other parts of the world. He's viewed by some international diplomats in other countries, particularly in Eastern Europe, as being quite inconsistent. He's also viewed as uh, by U.S. Uh, hawks on China and Russia as having been inconsistent in his dealings with Xi Jinping okay. and also uh, um, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, and tried to placate them in the past. And that hasn't gone down well. Nina, as ever, great to hear from you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Nina DeSantis there, former CNN anchor, giving us that uh, snapshot picture of French politics right now, which uh, is rather stormy.